Dependability people. Diamonds may be forever, and they certainly may be a girl's best friend. Gold prices in the stock market go up and down, but good diamonds always seem to go up. Still, most of us don't know very much about them. Oil sheiks and movie stars, of course, do. They buy diamonds for their glitter, glamour, and investment value. Young engaged couples, not able to afford all that much glitter, see them more symbolically. That sparkle means love. But how do they get from the diamond mine to the finger? What makes one diamond better than another? Are they a good investment? And how do you know that you're not getting rooked? Well, we know several places where you'll be safe if you can afford the price. This is Harry Winston's New York headquarters. He's the world's biggest buyer of top quality rough diamonds. Nearly $100 million worth of gems a year. You enter his guarded Fifth Avenue showroom by appointment only. He caters mostly to the carriage trade. And he's been in the diamond business for over 60 years. Harry Winston, however, doesn't allow his face to be photographed. That's a condition of his insurance policy. They're afraid of a mugging or kidnapping. At this moment, Mr. Winston is very proud of his latest acquisition. A 200 carat rough diamond that he's having cut into an 80 carat pear-shaped pendant. And you'll sell it, I hear, for four or five million dollars, is that right? I hope so. What kind of person would invest four or five million dollars in a stone? I'm not an American. I'll either go to Mexico, Venezuela, or one of the Arab countries. Well, that's where the money is. The American won't buy it. 120,000. 125,000. 125,000. 650,000. 650,000. And this is where they come from. The biggest source of rough diamonds is South Africa. More than a billion dollars a year. Diamond mining is like finding that proverbial needle in the haystack. They start with what their geologists have decided is diamond-bearing ore. Even so, they have to crush, screen, wash, and sift some 30 or 40 tons of waste material to find one gem-quality rough diamond of one carat, enough only for a very modest engagement ring. One of the final stages of this process is this one. Diamonds are one of the few minerals that stick to grease. So the diamond concentrate is washed over a grease-covered pan. The diamonds stick to it. But 80% of these are industrial quality, dark and opaque, not suitable for jewelry. Industrials are used for everything from oil drilling to dentistry, but they aren't gems. A gemstone, particularly a sizable one such as this, is a rare find. In this building behind me is a company called De Beers Consolidated Mines. This is their headquarters on Charterhouse Street in London. All of these rough diamonds are brought to De Beers headquarters here in London to be sorted, graded, and sold. De Beers controls, that is, produces and distributes, 80% of the world's diamonds as they come out of the ground. Since De Beers is, in effect, a world monopoly, the United States Department of Justice is after them on charges of violating American antitrust laws. But the Justice Department has never brought a single person working directly for De Beers into court because, for one thing, the company officially has no offices in the country. Still, De Beers executives are nervous about all of this. The United States represents one of their chief markets. They would not allow themselves to be interviewed for 60 minutes. We did manage to get films of some of their operations. There are more diamonds in this building at one time than any place on Earth. Ten times a year, or about every five weeks, Major buyers from all over the world are invited to London to purchase these uncut diamonds. There are only 210 buyers currently on the syndicate's approved list, all wholesalers or cutters. Each of them has notified De Beers in general terms what he wants to buy and how much he's willing to spend. A mere 100,000, or like Harry Winston on occasion, 25 million dollars. The buyer gets an assortment, roughly corresponding to what De Beers thinks he wants and what they think he should have. He examines it with his broker by a window facing the neutral northern sky. The buyer can occasionally haggle over a given stone, but by and large, it's take it or leave it. The entire package at the price quoted, no bargaining. When world demand is off, De Beers simply puts fewer diamonds up for sale and holds on to the rest. That's how the diamond syndicate works. But nobody seems to object to its autocratic methods because they ensure that everybody can make a profit. Back in New York, we asked Harry Winston if the syndicate could manipulate prices. Oh, they can manipulate prices. 
a few years ago, they, they, they increased it 100% in one year. Have they ever manipulated the prices downward? They don't do that. When the market's off, they don't lower the price, but they give you a better assortment. Roughly what Wall Street is to the stock business, this is to the polished diamond business. The biggest diamond house or exchange in the world is here in Antwerp, Belgium. More than a billion dollars a year in cut stones flow from here alone on the world markets, the United States being one of the largest markets. This is where the wholesalers of cut diamonds are represented by brokers to the buyers who eventually will put the stones into jewelry. As you can see, dealing is done here across tables, under windows facing, as always, the northern sky. Deals worth literally hundreds of thousands of dollars are concluded here with simply a nod or a word. On the floor of this diamond exchange, a man's word is everything. If anyone cheats or reneges on a deal here in this exclusive trading club, the exchange has the power to bar him from the diamond business everywhere in the world. Six thousand dollars, a car, ten cars. So it's roughly sixty thousand dollars for that stone. You have only his word that he will pay that money. No, that's enough. Diamond people talk a lot about trust, how a man's word is his bond. But these men are experts. The average retail customer doesn't know whom to trust, and he certainly can't tell whether he's getting his money's worth. If a top jeweler, such as Cartier of London, designs a diamond necklace for you, the question of value gets pretty complicated because you're paying for an original design, for workmanship, for gold or platinum, and for the name. But there is a kind of rule of thumb for most good diamond jewelry. If you buy a diamond for $10,000, you can't get more than $5,000 for it the same day. That's the difference between wholesale and retail. Hold on to it for five years, and you'll at least get your money back. Ten years, and you can probably make a good profit if it's a good stone. The bigger and better the stones are, the faster they will increase in value. The largest diamonds are getting scarcer and scarcer. But Cartier and Harry Winston are the cream of the cream, who cater to wealthy and loyal customers. The other end of the spectrum is on 47th Street in New York, the center of the mass American diamond market. These look like bargains, but they seldom are. They're cheaper, but the quality is lower, and they're not good investments. On the lowest end of the price range, people get more interested in the setting than the stone, which they can hardly see anyway. It's not wide enough. It doesn't fit the whole crop. Now, how much did you say that was? On the other hand, the crudest way to buy a diamond is by size and weight. It's also the worst way if you want to invest. Color, clarity, and the cut make all the difference. This New York retailer gives his customers more guidance than many dealers do. So, you said something that was very good. You said color is the most important thing, and for my money it is too, for one reason. When that ring is on your finger, what you see is the color. Nobody's gonna come up to you and say, what a beautiful ring, it's good. Nobody's gonna do that. Let's say for $1,000, you can get one stone that's bright yellow and perfect, or another stone that's the finest gem white color and very imperfect. One is at the top of one scale and the bottom of the other, and the other different scale. Most retail jewelers don't really know much about diamonds, and even experts can disagree about the worth of a stone. There are commercial grading laboratories, such as this one in London, that will analyze a diamond in terms of clarity, defects, and color. They charge a small fee. They won't tell you what it's worth, just how good it is. It's a very bad stone. There are many, many marks in it, not an investment stone. But the question still persists. How do diamonds rank as an investment? It depends whom you ask and whether they're talking about average diamonds or only the very best. Arthur Moneycandam is a prominent London diamond merchant. How often does the buyer of a small diamond at a retail store get his money's worth? Oh, I don't think this really applies at all. If you're talking about a diamond of a fifth of a carat or a quarter of a carat purchased in the credit jewelry store where you pay $5 down and $5 a week, I don't think it's on that you can ever get your money's worth. The store must have to work on two to 300% markup. And I don't think the public must expect that the diamond content value is in the diamond ring they've purchased. But the larger, high-quality stones are another matter, he feels. I can't prophesy what's going to happen, but if, for supposition, I can take a 10-year period between 1964 and 1974, when the value <coughs> of one to three-carat diamonds rose in the region of 
400 to 450 um, percent. Anybody having made a purchase way back in 64, coming to sell those diamonds today, having purchased them well at an investment, on an investment basis, should show a handsome profit. Eric Bruton is a British writer, lecturer, and one of the top experts in the field. He's more conservative. Hypothetical situation. I come into $15,000 cash. I say, I want to invest that money for my daughter. I think I'll buy $15,000 worth of diamonds. Is there any real likelihood that over the next 10 or 15 years, she and I could make what we might term a killing? Well, I would say no. What I think uh, you have got uh, as an asset, if you do buy stones, is, is what's commonly termed a hedge. In other words, uh, if you've got other kinds of investments, uh, and you have a few diamonds as well, then those diamonds are less likely to take a dive when other things are going down because uh, they're portable wealth. But if you expect to make a killing as an ordinary stock exchange killing, I think you're going to be very unlucky. Harry Winston, dealing only in the best stones, is bullish to say the least. Are they a good investment? Well, they've proved to be a good investment. In one year, I believe, in 73, DBS raised their prices five times 20%. And uh, with inflation, people that bought, with, especially with the currencies of the world being depleted, they did very well. Diamonds are a magic word today. Why are they a magic word? Well, people have, have a feeling they're buying something for investment. They're getting scarcer and scarcer. Of course, I have great confidence in diamonds, and that's my business. You have to have knowledge, know what you're doing. We never say no to a purchase. If it's priced right, we buy it. And this is the finished product, Harry Winston's $5 million diamond. We named it the Star of Independence. And I think it's one of the most beautiful diamonds in the world. Someday, there'll be an automatic system that fights high-rise fires. At the first sign of smoke, it will call the authorities, help isolate the burning area.